thank, thank you very much for that. I'm particularly um, appreciative of your injecting the private sector um, uh, perspective in, um, in, in, in how this isn't simply an intergovernmental um, issue. I'd like to open it up now to, um, to the floor. I'm particularly interested in comments that, um, or reflections on, on the status of global governance as you see it um, in taking stock in it. This question of, again, um, how the rising emerging powers versus established powers plays into um, um, the type of global governance we might see going forward. And then, um, and also this question of leadership. Yes, please. Thank you, John. Uh, Peter Jankovic. Um, I'm a former ambassador to various multilateral organizations, United Nations, OECD, etc. So I'm very interested in your subject. And um, uh, let me b b briefly um, uh, answer uh, uh, some, some points uh, of your, the, to, to, to the issues you raised. Uh, first, on the state of global governance, um, I think that the uh, present state of global government, particularly if one if looks at the United Nations and uh, specialized agencies, which are a very huge and very carefully prepared network after 1945, uh, the situation is not too good because uh, there has been for many, many years now a reluctance of many governments, uh, both uh, to developed and developing countries, uh, to create new, uh, powerful new organizations which can, uh, which can, um, which can uh, uh, deal with these uh, new major challenges. Uh, we, we have just been talking about the environment, and there has been a call for a long time now to create uh, an international environmental organization. There's a small UN office in Nairobi, uh, mm. but on the global scale, there's nothing. And uh, the same applies for, for many other fields of uh, where, where global governments uh, seems to be necessary. And uh, uh, even uh, the type of major international conferences that the United Nations used to run for some, for, for some time, perhaps with the exception of climate, uh, has now p p f completely stopped about huge conferences, for instance, on the question of women, conf conferences on, uh, on other major international, but all these have stopped because governments are afraid uh, that uh, some, that they might be forced uh, to, 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 to draw some, uh, uh, to, 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 to accept new obligations, and, uh, and so for that reason, uh, there's a certain stagnation uh, in, gov in global governments, uh, at least as far as, as the United Nations is concerned. Uh, and uh, on top of that, there's also a growing, uh, uh, there's a growing deficit uh, in interagency cooperation. Uh, as I just mentioned, there are many important specialized agencies of the United Nations, the United Nations itself, but uh, there's very little cooperation. Uh, there's very little interaction between these uh, uh, organizations. There are all kinds of interagency committees. Uh, but the efforts, you know, to, to, to use all this combined uh, wisdom, this combined, uh, this critical mass uh, is rather missing. Uh, the question you are raising is, of course, where might leadership come from? And of course, there have always been efforts to create a kind of countervailing power. Uh, it would be interesting, perhaps, in this context to study uh, the history of the non-aligned movement, which is forgotten now and which also perhaps uh, uh, has never been particularly effective. But strangely enough, it still exists. Uh, and um, uh, not a single country so far has left it. Also, it has not been particularly effective. Uh, and uh, also, the, the next year, it will have a pretty big problem because the next non-aligned summit will meet in Tehran. So. <laughs> This will be quite an interesting thing. But th this was an effort to create countervailing powers, uh, the same as uh, the, the group of 77, of which also one hears very little today. So there's certainly, uh, uh, some, there's, uh, there's certainly some efforts to create countervailing power, to, 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 to create new centers of leadership. Uh, in, the, in this context, uh, you have some, sometimes efforts like those of Venezuela and, and, and creating uh, uh, regional and sub-regional organizations, uh, but I mean these things go on, uh, and the question will be where, to where, 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 where are they going to end, and will they have any effect uh, uh, in the end? So I think these are these are the, the are some of the uh, the, the, the uh, thoughts that come to mind if you ask these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just comment on um, the non-aligned and G77? I mean, from a uh, you know, 
I co-authored a, a report on UN Security Council reform and U.S. national interests. And you know, from a U.S. perspective, and again, this is very much a U.S. perspective, um, the G77 and the NAM, um, although you don't hear about them that often, are seen frequently as being sort of problematic and anachronistic um, and sort of locked into um, Cold War slash post-colonial mindsets in a way that um, is not particularly helpful or conducive to dealing with problems that of, of a new era in a way. And um, I, I realize that's a controversial statement and, and, and if there were or perhaps if there were more people here from from that world, they they might uh, they might take me to task for that statement. But um, one of the hopeful, I mean, one of the questions about Security Council reform, for instance, is this question of um, if you actually had India or Brazil, for instance, on um, a, as a permanent member, how would they behave? Um, would they behave? Would they take a global view of their responsibilities? Again, this is from a U.S. perspective, or would they, in a sense, import? Um, you know, mindsets that uh, the U.S., you, again, from a U.S. perspective, would, would find problematic, um, despite being also uh, d democratic countries. So, so it's, a, it's just a, again, reinforces the question of, and the importance of values and as a, um, as a determining factor with how, how countries look at some of these, uh, some of these issues. Um, let me, I think you were next, and then. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we had a very good introduction with these two interventions giving somewhat the two sides of the coin, in a way. Uh, and uh, this is giving a rather, I would say, appropriate uh, description of this mix uh, we are confronted with in terms of governance. I just have, would like to mention from my experience, I'm a special representative of the European Union for Central Asia <clears throat> for the last five years. Uh, and uh, what strikes me is that you have not mentioned in this, I quote the, the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, the components uh, of global governance, and uh, it didn't appear much in, your, in, the, in the evaluations of the present state of governance. It's social problems were mentioned, but migrations, migrations, uh, and connected ethnic problems. Uh, I mean, we know that in Europe, uh, look at Lampedusa and so on and so on. It's, an, it's a full continent in, in motion and we are not going to stop that uh, through naval forces and so on. So we have a major problem of governance because it goes back to the village in the middle of Sahel. Uh, the other uh, component is crime. I mean, the best governance today, I'm sorry, is with crime. You have about 20, 30 international criminal networks who have no problems with the border and who have been the first benef uh, benefic uh, beneficiaries of, of globalization of the last 20 years. I mean, some argue that this is the equivalent of GNP of Sweden. Uh, some say, well, it's much more than that, uh, 10 times more. So, I mean, even the, the debate about the amount which is at stake, I'm mentioning that because I, I, I could see that through the, the uh, heroin production uh, from, uh, uh, from Afghanistan, which is just sweeping uh, the Eurasian continent. Uh, I'm not an expert in the in dimension of cocaine, but when I see that now we have to fight cocaine from Colombia in Kenya uh, and through Somalia, I mean, you, you have the best example of globalization. I mean, they know how uh, to, 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 to manage, and they are far better than we will ever be, in, in a way. And this, I, I think, is a rather uh, disturbing element uh, which we have to integrate in, in this thinking. Second, the point about the 158,000 uh, conventions, yes, indeed. Uh, and in your introduction, uh, so, uh, Patrick, you mentioned the uh, chemicals con convention. I was one of the negotiators. What I, I can see, I mean, how much it has weighed on the chemical industry. They were very reluctant at the beginning. It, it was a pain in the neck. But at the same time, we got it on board and say, well, you have already a, a, a problem with public opinions. They don't like chemical industry. If you in any way endure the risk of being taken by supposition into this field, you are killed. And so better for you to be on board. And uh, in the end, it works. This is an international convention which is really forbidding. And for the whole, I mean, one can say it has been managed in the last 20 years, which means that 20 years ago, uh, I mean, everybody was more or less convinced that chemical weapons were going to be the chemical, uh, the nuclear weapon of the poor. Uh, the question is not uh, anymore there. Uh, 
So, in a way, I mean, we have this piling up of conventions. And if only to correct the point about this huge amount, look at our national laws. We have tens of thousands of laws which are either superseded or, or just disappearing. You have the same phenomenon. So, we have an overload of legal uh, uh, attempts to manage a more complex reality. And we all complain in our parliaments that we are now uh, making absurd or, 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 or uh, obsolent, uh, obsolescing uh, laws in, in a matter of months. And everybody is, is, is uh, uh, crying and, 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 and deploring that. But this, this is a wider social phenomenon where the quality of the law of the past is now more or less lost in a good measure of lawmaking in, in, many, in many countries. So we have a problem there. Are you, are you saying that because it's being superseded by law at the international level? No, I'm, I'm saying that the phenomenon at the national level mm -hmm. is exactly the same as the building of the conventions. Okay, right, right, so, right, right. I mean, as first, uh, you, you see a problem, well, let's try to have a convention. Right, right, right. Uh, and and this, this is, uh, this is uh, incremental in a way. So we, we, it's, it's a kind, may, maybe a sickness of postmodernity, who knows? But, I mean, uh, we, we have changed our vision of the law without measuring that, and the same for the convention, in a way. I, I finish with this uh, point you have described where uh, the complexity is not manageable. Yes, but then in such cases, which are organizational problems, you, you have to come to subunits. You have to come to uh, intermediate levels. Uh, it's become, uh, you have too much moving at the top. Here, interesting, as you know, and this is also connected with the demonstrations and so on, you have the deglobalization movement. And of course, this is populist, this is elementary and so on. But in some cases, de-escalating the generalization is probably a pertinent question. And, and, and coming back to, to, to lower levels, rather than just pushing up all the time the problem. And I, I think that here, some kind of uh, ex post reflection after this uh, first wave of, wave of globalization could be a direction in mythology. I would finish in mentioning something which has been striking for some kind of crisis management I've seen at lower level, Central Asia, uh, Caucasus, and so on. Uh, it's the gathering of international organization. This is a rather interesting movement. Uh, in more or less what you uh, recalled about April 2009, uh, when you have a crisis, everybody recognizes is, is beyond reach and, and would stick together. And the, the case is also valuable for uh, applied for the organization. I mean, be it this uh, ethnic uh, killings and crisis in Kyrgyzstan, it's limited, it's a small country, maybe. We decided three days after the revolution between EU, uh, OSC, and UN that it would work together, that we would have a, a, a weekly meeting and so on. They have had now their third elections. They have a constitutional transfer of uh, power to the new president in Central Asia. No president in the last 20 years. So I don't say we made it, but I mean, it was the recognition that uh, we will all be criticized because the trend is to criticize international organization, but better to sit together because then we begin to, to, to manage something. And I think that around Afghanistan, post 2014, you will see the same because it's, 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 a, it's in a way, going to be worse, but we are all entangled with people there risking to be killed by mobs and so on, uh, and we'll have uh, some uh, new problems with Taliban. We cannot get out of it. We are committed. We have money, which is earmarked. So this kind of sitting together and even going beyond just sitting together, what I would call mutualization. I mean, we speak a lot about mutualization in front of the euro crisis. It's painful and it's complicated, but I think it's more or less the trend. That is, we don't shape necessary in authority. It has an ad hoc character, but it, it, it admits that on a real problem, lasting problem, we'll have to stick together and join forces for quite a long time.